Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Museum Lives in Post-Pandemia. My name is Mira Herschler and I work for NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organizations. As the Network for Museums in Europe, our main activities are advocating for museums at EU level, providing training opportunities, providing a platform for museums to exchange and learn from each other, and help museums to cooperate across borders. In this function, Nemo felt it was necessary to document and analyze the impact of the coronavirus situation on the museums in Europe. In the past weeks, Nemo has carried out a survey to look at how museum budgets and operations have been affected, how museums cope in these times, how they reorganize their structures and offer new services to their audiences. Over 650 museums from over 41 countries have so far responded to the survey. You can find the first results and recommendations on NEMO's website. NEMO also recently created an interactive map with the reopenings of museums in Europe, or at least with the plans for the next steps. We will provide you with the link to this map after the webinar. We are now looking forward to today's webinar that will be facilitated by Sandro de Bono from Malta, a museum thinker and cultural strategist. Sandra's professional experience and commitments are quite extensive, so I leave the introduction to him once he starts the session. This webinar shall explore the ways and means how institutions can sustain relevance over these challenging times, how museums can keep sight of their community's needs and ambitions as these evolve and change over time. At the end of the webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask Q&A questions with the chat function. And I now hand over to Sandra de Bono and wish you all a fruitful session. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Hello from Malta. I'm Sandro de Bono. Uh, I'm a museum thinker and a culture strategist, active uh, based in Malta, but also active on the international field. I, my, I mean, my experience is, is, uh, also includes uh, a reading of a national museum, uh, quite a tough, a tough challenge, uh, which I delivered over 12 years, uh, transforming uh, the National Museum of Fine Arts in Malta into MUSA, a National Community Art Museum, uh, where we also hosted the NEMO uh, annual conference in 2018. Uh, now I'm active much more in academia, uh, and this uh, COVID-19 situation was a golden opportunity for me to research and to understand trends and uh, try to figure out how things might be changing or could be changing or will be changing in the coming weeks and months. I'm also active as an advisor with the Office of the President in Malta and I'm quite active also uh, in blogging. I run my blog publication, The Humanist Museum, and probably some of you might actually connect some of the ideas that we'll be discussing today to some of the blog posts that I was uh, posting over the past uh, few weeks. Museum lives in post pandemia And I think this is where we stand today. Uh, museums are uh, uh, closed. They have to close in, uh, in, in, a, very, in a very fast, uh, very quick uh, um, and response. Uh, most museums didn't have time to, to, to plan anything. And to, and to figure out how they can react effectively and incisively to this, to this situation. In a sense, uh, we're all on the same page. Uh, practically, the vast majority, the bulk uh, of museums around the world are at this, at this situation. And uh, it has been a bit of a, of a pandemia. It has been a, quite chaotic. Um, museums tried to react to this to a situation that they never uh, experienced before. Uh, they had to work behind closed doors and reach out uh, their publics uh, right outside, but with closed doors. So anything physical became literally uh, irrelevant and what began to matter at very short notice were many other things. Uh, most of all, uh, the digital and the web experience. What is also interesting that most museums have been through this transition. I'm showing a 
chart. Um, it's known as the Kubler-Ross curve. Um, uh, Kubler-Ross was a was a Swiss uh, Swiss academic who who, who researched. Uh, transitions um, on patients, this comes from the medical field, transitions on patients um, who were termin terminally ill. So um, there, is a, there are a number of phases where you are first caught in shock uh, to really discover something that you were not expecting, and then patients would move on to uh, accepting the situation it would lead to depression or difficult uh, circumstances, uh, mental circumstances, and then they would move on to, um, to, to an experimental phase, to, the, to a decision phase, and to engage with the, with the, with the known, uh, with, with, the, with the context, with the new, with the new context. And this is, uh, this is a very interesting parallel to what museums have been through. They've been in shock at the situation, They've had to accept the status quo, that uh, the physical experience is no more. There were situations of depression, the museums were getting lost, they didn't know what to do, they didn't know how to react. Then they began to experiment, some of them, and some of them came up with some very interesting things that I will be discussing as well as well today, deciding a way forward and engaging. Not all museums around the world are at the same stage of the Kubler-Ross curve. Uh, some of them have moved through this curve very fast. Others are still struggling with accepting the status quo. What is sure uh, in the circumstances is that we will not go back to where we were just a few weeks ago. It will be a new normal which we need to discover, which we need to understand, if possible, very quickly. Now, things take time. It's not that easy, but perhaps through these discussions, through these debates, through all the information that is being provided by very many on very many social media platforms, we can actually find uh, a way forward out of the situation. I'd like to move on to, to, to this chart, which shows um, projections that have been mapped out by Nemo in this very insightful um, research survey that was, that was made public uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, with additional uh, information that is being made uh, available uh, on Twitter, on social media, as we still uh, move along, as, as, we, as we move forward. I must remind you that the survey is still, or has been still works in progress until a few days ago, so there is more information, more data that needs to be processed. In, from a certain, from an angle, from a particular angle, it's saying very much what we know. There is a loss of income. You just know that the blue bar is the positive, positive response. The the not the yellow bar is the negative response, and the unsure answers are are grey. So we know it. There is a loss of income. There is a loss of uh, income from the shops, income from ticketing sales, and not so much loss of private funding, um, but what is interesting and what perhaps museums need to really think about is, is the alternative services and the need to think about new financing models. As you can see, um, there are some who are considering this, there are others, and the yellow bar is quite, uh, um, quite dominant there, that are not. We might not get to a situation where we have the same funding uh, that we had in a, in, in a few weeks' time, that the, that the patents that were there uh, a few weeks ago um, might not be there now to, to support our programming, our outreach uh, initiatives, and so on and so forth. So there is really a need to rethink the funding models. But what is most important in all this is to reinvent the museum idea. That is the point of departure that we shall be discussing today. And our point of departure is also trying to understand what really made sense over the past two, three uh, weeks from the, uh, from the pandemonium that we were uh, going through and what we can already extract, uh, which is meaningful and which can be applied also without any financial, uh, financial strains. On the, on, the, on the institution. And I'd like to mention three examples that I thought were very in, insightful. And I consider these to be insightful because 
practically the whole sector was moving very fast to go digital, to try to create the right web interface, to improve that uh, interface, and to be much more present online. But these uh, three examples, uh, two of them in particular, and the third one has implications, has potential to be developed much more in the coming months and years to, in, in, the, in, the, in the coming months and weeks to come, um, I thought were very insightful. The first example comes from the Le Museum in, in the Netherlands. Now, this is, I consider to be this museum as a very forward looking institution. It is, a, it is an art museum and uh, it's, its collection is about food and consumption. They have a, they have a website but they decided to go for something which uh, struck me as being very original. They decided to go for phone calls. Uh, in fact, they came up with a project called ViewPhone, uh, where you would, where, um, where the public would book a slot, and you would receive a 10-minute call from from a curator, and then that would be follow up. That there, there would be a follow up with an email. So when everybody was going digital, these guys with some out of the box thinking, decided to go the other way. And they were uh, quite, quite incisive, quite effective in reaching out uh, to their audiences. Another example comes from Poland. This is the Poland Museum in Warsaw. It's a, a museum about the history of Polish Jews. And uh, once again, uh, the digital experience was there. The web interface, the web platforms were there, but instead they also opted rather than instead they also chose to go for radio transmissions and this is an idea which was also experimented in China uh, there are Chinese museums who ended up with uh, three hour transmissions and getting some uh, 300,000, 400,000 people following uh, these radio transmissions the idea is so simple and yet it, they could reach out audiences in a very effective and very uh, original way uh, these two examples obviously do not work in a vacuum. They were part of a of a bigger of a bigger um, output, a bigger input to reach audiences. But my point at this stage is: uh, can these be developed further? Can this be one uh, possible way forward for museums to think simple, uh, even with the budget uh, constraints that all of us have, and to come up with ideas how to reach audiences that might not be something uh, which is a one size fits all. The third example, which you know about, is the Getty Art Challenge. I hope that some of you actually went for it. I didn't, but I'd love to <laughs> at some point in time. I, I was busy following trends and, and researching all that was happening. I could see quite a variety of, of, of reactions. Obviously, this is a digital uh, platform now, and. Uh, the, the platform made it possible for uh, this challenge to reach uh, all, all corners of the world. And you could get some interesting uh, examples as the, as the, as the um, Salome holding the head of John the Baptist at the top, which is practically a replica or close to a replica of the original painting. And you could have a more uh, informal, uh, witty type of reaction uh, to the to the early Renaissance uh, icon uh, in, in that particular collection, which is the image that you see at the lower end of the presentation. But what is interesting, and I so far I haven't come across any research which builds on this um, very interesting initiative, is that there is visual literacy in this. People were studying these paintings, they were looking at these paintings, they were trying to understand how the light falls on the, on the texture of the clothing, on the figure, uh, and the composition in general. They were trying to replicate this. And I'm showing a, a chart uh, which refers to visual, visual literacy studies. And you can actually connect some of the, some of the, um, some of the concepts that we, that we study in visual literacy to what was happening with the Getty Arts Challenge. People were evaluating images, people were interpreting and analyzing images, they were creating media, they were also finding images, obviously. So this could be an interesting potential for our museums to explore because it enriches the understanding of the collection. And uh, 
it's also a way how to stay relevant at this point in time, but it could also a way how to actually provide education facilities and education platforms to, to, your, to, your, to, your, to your community. So three examples uh, which I extracted out of the pandemonium of, 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 of initiatives that can ho do hold potential in my humble opinion and which can be developed, which can be developed um, uh, further. Now, the question that most of us are asking is, who is the audience now? We were accustomed to a situation where audiences would come through the main door of the museum and loads of studies. Um, we, most museums have the museum profile, uh, the typical visitor, uh, well, well defined, and the, the ambitions as to what type of visitor profiling they would like to reach and so on and so forth. That is obviously not there at this point in time. And that is obviously the, the need and, uh, to understand if this, this, uh, this new uh, museum public, this, the, the museum public that will visit the, the post-COVID museum will still be pretty safe. At this point in time, I don't know how many museums would uh, pay to know what these two people are, are, are looking for on, on the screen. I mean, I, I'm taking it as a, as, as a cue, obviously, but uh, loads of, loads of uh, museums are trying to understand what the publics out there need. Some of them have reacted in a very interesting way. I know a case about, about, uh, of, of one particular case where um, uh, just a Google sheet was being circulated and people were literally putting in their ideas, museum directors, museum people were putting in their, their ideas of who this hypothetical audience was, uh, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm representing on this screen. Um, um, uh, you would have parents with, with, with children who would need uh, a particular type of, of, uh, of engagement, teachers lost at sea trying to find uh, information, people who are bored at home who don't know what to do and who might be interested in, in, in engaging with a, with a museum experience, loads of things. Now there are surveys coming up, which we shall be discussing them, which are a bit more insightful uh, and which can help us build uh, a new form of interaction, a new form of a, a, engagement for different types of museums. But going back to the, to the NEMO, uh, survey, uh, we know that 60% of European museums went digital. So that was the preferred choice for 60% of uh, European museums. And they actually shifted stuff uh, in the charts uh, at the bottom. They actually shifted 30% uh, of their stuff, um, uh, of their stuff working on, uh, in the museum to work on, on the digital, on the web. Uh, interface. Now obviously this is a challenge in itself because it doesn't mean that these staff were trained uh, properly, have the right level of expertise to engage in the long term. So there's probably the need to retrain staff here at this point in time. But some museums, as just 4%, actually went to employ digital, employ someone to work on the online, online presence. Now, this could be something which I'm sure could be in increasing in the not too distant future. But what is important as well at this point in time is to understand the impact. How much is this having an impact on the publics out there that museums have been trying to understand for, uh, for the past weeks? And this also comes up from the NEMO seminar, and I thought this is very insightful. From those museums who replied to the survey, only 40% 40 museum, 40 of the museums who replied to the survey actually registered an increase in online activity. So from the, uh, from the whole spectrum of European museums active online and those who actually answered the survey, only 40% registered an increase. And out of, out of those 40% out of that segment, 41% uh, noticed a small increase, a 10 to 20% increase. Does this mean that people are not engaging online? Does this mean that all this effort is not having the desired impact that museums 
thought they could have in the short term. There is an answer coming from the latest survey produced by, um, by uh, published by the American Alliance of Museums, and it actually confirms that um, it might be the case that people are not looking for the museum experience that we think they might be after. And if I can comment on this, on this uh, screenshot, um, this survey uh, gives some indications as to how publics are reacting. For example, some actually didn't even occur to them that they should be looking up museums or engaging with museums online. Some of them actually had no time because children were at home, uh, they had to follow them, uh, follow up uh, on their studies, helping them with their, with their uh, homework, with their online work, and so on and so forth. Anxiety, which is becoming a problem as well. People are getting fed up, staying inside, so they wouldn't even want to think about, about museums. There is also the perception that museums are only there to provide information for children. Getting tired of screen time, you can stay so much in front of a screen, and most of us probably are, are experiencing this. Uh, so this is very much what the reaction in America is. And this comes up from a survey just published a few days ago. This does not mean that museums should not be engaging with content, but it is perhaps uh, the right time or we need to really think how, what type of content, what type of publics, are, are waiting for this content, might be interested in, in this content, and how to package it correctly. Last week, practically a few days ago, um, this, uh, this survey, this, this uh, data was published on, on social media, and I think it is, it is, very, it is very indicative. Um, this is Google Trend, and this refers to the use of virtual museum tours and how people are engaging with virtual museum tours across the globe. This is a world trend. It's not focused specifically on the United States. It's a general trend worldwide. As you can see, there was a peak registered around late February, early March, quite a spike. Uh, the first chart uh, describes the situation for virtual museum tours between the 1st of January 2004 right up to, to where we are now. So it's quite a chunk of, of, uh, of, uh, of time, uh, close to 16 years. Um, and uh, as you can see, there was a spike, a very sharp spike on the use of virtual museum tours on access uh, from all over the world uh, for virtual museum tours, but it then dropped. Uh, almost all of a sudden, which means that although virtual museum stores are a very important tool, are a useful tool, it doesn't mean that we can, museums can or should be relying just on that particular tool. It's just another tool from a toolbox that museums need to engage with the, with the, with the communities. Uh, I actually posted this on, on, on social media and uh, Musée Drone actually got in touch on Twitter and decided to make my, my work a little bit uh, simpler and they uh, reacted with this chart. Uh, I'm just going to summarize what this is all about because this data uh, and this, uh, this reaction to uh, Museum Virtual Tours was published by Museum Hack uh, and it took everyone by, by surprise in a way. Well, some were not that much, that much surprised, but they actually, uh, they actually discovered that uh, there were three things that uh, people are interested in, and that was virtual field trips for kids, uh, parents who want to engage with their kids at, uh, using uh, web, web interface, using museums to, to, to engage with kids, Quarantine data ideas. Now, this is very interesting. People are looking for dates and they're looking for social media platforms and information online, uh, and they were looking at museums to find their answers and things to read. So, if you compare uh, how virtual museums tour, how virtual museum tours were uh, 
actually were actually performing and how the other three three uh, three needs uh, were actually registered there's an interesting uh, an interesting story there the museum virtual tours actually peaked then they went uh, low uh, not as low as they were before but they are part of a, of a, of a package uh, that people are, are engaging with. And as you can see, uh, quarantine date ideas are, are actually even more, even more in, in, in demand. And what Museum Hack rightly pointed out, which I found also very, very uh, insightful, is that uh, things to read, uh, people looking for information online, is the trend that will survive, that will continue to grow and to develop further. As you can see, the green uh, graph uh, is a constant. It has been on increase uh, over a lengthy period of time. So there is uh, a constant increase and there is potential for this to, to get even, even better. So what are, what are audiences uh, after? What, what type of, of content can museums actually, actually, actually provide? And this also comes from the from the American Alliance of of Museums um, uh, um, Research, uh, the, sto st uh, the story poster uh, just published. Uh, what is insightful is you've got obviously uh, six six categories. It's all about having. It's mostly about having fun. It's about it's about it's about discovery. It's about learning new things, but it's not about the traditional visit. It's not about discovering a painting. It's not about discovering a collection or having an experience. It's about fun, do and share activities, things that surprise and delight, sharing hope and beauty. People essentially want to have fun. People want the museum to be a fun place, even if it's just a click away, even if it's just a virtual uh, experience. And what is being what is being suggested is that uh, information needs to be shorter, much more concise, much more contained, because people don't have time to read. They might be stressed out. They they might have much more on the plate than just the museum experience or interest in visiting visiting or engaging with a with a with a museum experience online. So bits and bytes of information contained, which could actually be much more effective. And this explains also. What probably most of you uh, are conversant uh, with by now, the hashtag the cowboy uh, experience, uh, which comes from the National Cowboy Museum. They actually got the head of security to engage online and he was learning the ropes as he was engaging with his publics and it was a huge success. It's not, it was not important what type of information, how academically correct that information was being provided. It was not important as to the packaging, as to how, how the, if the dates are correct or not. It was about an experience, it was about a new form of engagement that people were not expecting, that museum publics behind the screens were not accepting. And I think this is a very good example, which could have, have potential. I was having conversations with colleagues in Malta, uh, a curator of a house museum, uh, and I was actually discussing with her this, this possibility, how you can actually tell ghost stories, for example, which relates to, to the history of the place, and you can make uh, people uh, curious, excited, not just online, but also to visit once uh, the museum, once the Historic House Museum is open again to your, to your public. What about the coming months then? What should we be expecting? Now, obviously, I have to put in my disclaimers. I'm not a prophet. I, I cannot predict the future. But there are some interesting trends, some interesting threads, some interesting information that can help us understand how things might be evolving in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I've just actually tweeted a, a, a data sheet uh, this morning, which gives uh, an update picture of uh, of, the, of the situation as to when museums will be reopening again. And I think from that data and from that information that, that is being provided, uh, we know that uh, by July, late July, practically the whole museum landscape, international museum landscape, or most of it might be back again, uh, open, accessible, back to business. Obviously, 
it will not be the same type of experience. And we already have this information coming from China. Uh, we also have this information coming from museums uh, in Northern Europe that actually remained open, stayed open. And there are a number of restrictions that have been introduced. So uh, masks obviously uh, are, are mandatory. Some, uh, so in some instances, museums are expected to accommodate just a maximum of 50% of the capacity they had before the COVID-19 pandemic. In China, for example, you have the obligation of presenting a certificate, a health certificate, the app, uh, the app situation where uh, the Chinese government is also, was also using apps to monitor uh, the health, uh, the, 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 the state of health of, of, of the citizens. So this will certainly be, not be a return to normal. It will not be uh, the place to show, to socialize. It will not be the place to, 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 to go with your family, perhaps at this point in time, at the beginning. Uh, there are a number of, of restrictions. Now, some museums might be, might, be getting, might be getting frustrated. And I perfectly understand that because if, when, if you're a museum and you're accustomed to getting so much visitors um, and you end up with just 20 or 30, um, that, is, that is frustrating. Actually, it might be the case that those, for those museums reopening, the cost to run the museum would actually be higher than if they stay closed. I don't want to suggest this because museums are not there to make profit. They are there to, to service, to be there. They are uh, institutions for the communities. So it's very important that uh, museums look beyond this. But yes, from a business point of view, it, it, could not make, it might not make sense at all. Uh, so what can be done? What are the possibilities? And what type of information, what trends, what can we be expecting uh, to happen in the coming weeks and months? Um, a few days ago, uh, we, we got this, uh, this very interesting uh, research uh, published in, in, in the UK. It's the Alpha Attractions Recovery Tracker, published by the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions in the UK. And it is indicative of what uh, other, other countries might be a, might be experiencing in the in the coming weeks and months. If I can summarize the conclusions of the survey, um, it's a highly cautious market. Um, people, uh, publics would be dealing with with, uh, with with fear. So museums are uh, the most important thing for the to for for museums is to deal. It's very crucial to deal with with fear. People who are fearful to return. Uh, to a space that is closed rather than open, because it seems that the trend would be that people might prefer to go out in the open, as, even if it's, a, if it's an open uh, a garden, a zoo, an, an open space. So museums might need to think about their open spaces uh, much more uh, in, in detail. In, obviously, there is, there is the awareness that we need time to get it right. Museums need time to get it right, because there is no one size fits all. Uh, this is, these are just trends, this is research being generated over uh, a very particular span of time. There are uh, research companies, agencies who are actually carrying out research every week to understand how things are evolving. Uh, there is the indication that people are willing to visit again because they've been uh, inside for, for, for quite some time. So the willingness to visit is, is, is there and it's, it's increasing. But there is a sense of uh, cautiousness, which is to be, which is to be expected. So in this case, what this chart is saying is that we might expect a return to a normality of sorts in the coming five months. Um, if we look closely at this chart, there is a very small percentage, just seven percent, who are keen on visiting over the next month once the museum is open. There is slightly more, which is interested in this thing between three, over the three to six month period. But uh, we go beyond the 50% uh, um, bracket if we think of a return to a normality, to a new normality uh, between six to 12 months. So the average is five months, five and a half months. We might be expecting uh, a return 
of visitors, perhaps not to the to the level that we had before before the COVID the the, the COVID pandemic, uh, but uh, a return to normality will take time. That is essentially at the point of this presentation. What would be the concerns? Again, quoting this the survey, I mean the highest ranking is being given to the need of a safe environment. Uh, museum publics uh, who will be visiting museums, interested in going back to museums uh, over the next uh, five to six months, would be absolutely very concerned, very keen on health and safety. They want to be sure that they are visiting, that they are experiencing a safe environment. And I think this is something to be, to be expected. They are not after getting discounts, in a way, even if discounts would help, they are not after um, or less after getting recognition for their loyalty. Uh, they are much more keen on health and uh, health uh, needs, health, health, health requirements. If we go by indoor and outdoor facilities, you can see that uh, there is uh, there is more uh, more concern with with uh, indoor in, in, indoor spaces rather than than outdoor spaces. Now, this obviously should get museums to think um, how they can actually bridge um, spaces that that are uh, open spaces within their with, within their remit. How they can use those spaces uh, to balance to buffer. Uh, the increase or to push for or to facilitate the increase uh, in visitors going uh, inside their, 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 uh, their galleries or their, or their halls or their, uh, or their uh, exhibition spaces. Uh, I think obviously these, the, this survey refers to the UK situation. It's very specific. It's, it's, it has to be taken as a survey carried out at this point in time. This was published just uh, a few days ago. Things might be changing, but the trends are already indicative of what museums might be experiencing in the coming weeks and months. Um, as I did mention earlier before, what came across clearly is that the data collected at, in, at a certain point in time, week one or week two, uh, was gradually changing, was developing, or the indications that the survey or this data collected at week one or week two uh, were developing, were changing when uh, the same data or the same approach was being taken three or four weeks later. So the situation is still a bit, a bit uh, um, volatile. It's still, it's still uneasy. It's very difficult to predict trends, but these might be indicative of what uh, European museums might be, might be experiencing. What to do then? How can we deal with the situations? How can museums handle? This situation where, where you have um, less visitors coming in, a social obligation to open your doors again and to welcome your, your visitors, your publics, perhaps new publics who might have discovered you uh, online, uh, others who might have heard of you, some who might not have been to visit for ages and who might have missed their visit or remember that there's your museum uh, which is worth their time and worth a, a, a visit. How do we handle this? I think the point of departure, the most important thing, is that we cannot go for just one tool. Digital, the web interface, the online uh, interface is important, is necessary, but it is not the only tool that museums should be using. Because as we have seen with uh, virtual tools, we had a peak and then suddenly uh, that peak went almost back to where it was, slightly higher uh, than, than, than before, but it was not the only solution. Um, we have restrictions, museums have restrictions, um, which they have to handle. So it's very important to think not just of one tool, but to think of a toolbox. What are the tools that we need to address the current situation? What are the tools that can help us develop new things this is the right opportunity to develop new ideas, new projects. 
I was having a conversation with a colleague uh, based in London a few days ago, and he actually mentioned what Winston Churchill once, once said, never miss the opportunity of a crisis. And this is it. There is opportunity in all that is happening around us. There is frustration, yes. There are challenges that museums need to tackle, need to handle, but there is also there are also very many opportunities. I'll briefly uh, engage with three of these uh, opportunities. I'll be going into more detail uh, in my next blog, uh, in my next blog post on the Humanist Museum. But for the time being, on this on this platform, I'll just focus on 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 three possibilities, three ideas that museums can can engage with and can develop in a rather simple, straightforward uh, thing. I'd like to synthesize uh, these three ideas with this image. In English, we say, when life gives you lemons, make lemonades. So uh, I, I see very much the situation that museums are currently in as being a situation of, 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 of lemons. No, it, it's, 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 it's a sour taste that, uh, that will not go away um, anytime soon. But there is an opportunity, as I was saying, to actually develop new, new ideas. And uh, I'm going to, 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 to synthesize these three ideas with the lemon and lemonade uh, approach. The first situation is this. Museum publics don't want to use handheld devices. This is a, this is a problem, no? Uh, many museums have gone, have invested heavily in the, in the hands-on experience, in the digital experience, touch screens, uh, lots of interface. Uh, some museums actually go just by that, or it's a very important uh, chunk of, 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 the, of the experience that they that, that they uh, provide uh, and that is very frustrating because you have an investment that cannot be used but there is an opportunity because at this point in time there is a new museum netizen out there behind your screen who might not necessarily be interested straight away in what you are providing as we have seen uh, before but would still we still expect you to provide content and provide uh, feed. Now, in one of, one of my latest blog posts, I do mention transmedia. Transmedia, possible way forward on how museums can engage in the circumstances. And this is it. You could actually invite people to visit your museum. You can have your, you can have your ticket. You can actually um, provide the traditional tour, perhaps, and not having the digital content on the interactive experiences. Uh, available, but those could be available online with the same ticket. They could also be uh, exclusive for the visitor. So you could actually be bridging the content, uh, the online content that you would like to provide, which is will be certainly all increase, and to bridge it with the physical experience of the visit. So your visit could start online. It, it, it is already the case, but this could be developed much further. There is much more potential. Uh, we do mention uh, digital fairs, that the first thing that you would do is to look up for information on your mobile, on your on your digital uh, interface. But this could actually be the point of departure. It could be the seeds for a new experience, which could bridge the virtual with the physical, with the physical visit. So people could actually visit your museum. They could perhaps engage online at first, trying to understand what your museum is all about. Then visit your museum. Um, um, uh, physically, and perhaps with that same ticket, you, they could actually download content that is uh, part of the visit, which they can continue online after they have been to your to your museum. It's a time to test these possibilities. It's just one idea. I'm sure there are many more ideas out there being being uh, incubated, and I'm very looking forward to understand what uh, what uh, most of you will be experimenting with in the coming weeks and months. The second idea, the second lemon is obviously visitor numbers. Visitor numbers are very low. This is far worse than we expected them to be. And this is the reaction that I'm getting from colleagues in Serbia, from colleagues in, in, in Sweden and uh, other places. Obviously, it is, it is, it is not, it, it is not uh, a positive thing. I mean, it, 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 it is frustrating. But there is an opportunity in this. We can actually provide personalized tours 
going much more personalized and giving a special treat to those people who actually venture and are courageous enough to come to visit. Now, this is something which can also bridge with the LEM museum experience in the Netherlands, where they actually call people over the phone and they actually engage with them, uh, starting off with an item in their, in their collection. There is potential there. Uh, the LEM museum experiment, I believe, I consider that to be a, a successful uh, project. It is perhaps time to take it forward, to experiment more with, with that type of approach and to bridge uh, the physical and to provide a physical experience that is much, that is much more focused, that is much more uh, incisive and which is much more human centered. It, it goes much more, much more capillary. Obviously, this can also help gain trust. It could also help your institution to gain trust and the confidence and the comfort that your museum, your space is a safe space, is a space of solace, is, is, a, is a place to visit, and it's a welcome space. Building trust with a very simple approach, starting off from a lemon and creating a lemonade. The third and final uh, example are masks. Every, most of us are expected to wear masks. Even in Malta here, uh, there is the obligation to wear uh, a mask. And there are loads of health requirements and, 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 and restrictions uh, that, have, that museums will be expected to introduce. Now, this could also be an opportunity. How about providing personalized masks? I've seen masks uh, featuring Van Gogh's sunflowers, for example, but the potential is endless. It could be a trend, it could be a fashion, and museums can be very much active in all this. It could also be a situation where hygiene-related stories can be bridged with the experience, uh, with the needs of the restrictions that are, that, that, that are, that, that are imposed. A painting which, which, con which tells a story about hygiene or health uh, issues or requirements and uh, the, 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 the health and the, the, the hygiene restrictions and the health, health restrictions can actually bridge with this. I can see potential in, in all this. Obviously, it's about looking at the lemon as a potential glass of, of lemonade. The most important thing, and I, I'll be wrapping up my presentation, my webinar, with these three questions is for museums to keep questioning themselves, to keep themselves in constant questioning. And I think now more than ever before, museums really need to think hard about these three questions. What do we stand for? This is something which I used very much in Malta when I was at the beginning of my 12-year of, of my, of my, uh, project, the uh, reading of the National Museum of Fine Arts. I used to tell my team, do we actually need a museum? That was the first question, because for now we don't need one. But if we need a museum, then what type of museums? What does a museum stand for? What does your institution stand for? And by answering these questions, by trying to understand what, what you stand for, then you can engage with a new norm. You can be much more equipped uh, to engage with a new norm. But uh, we need to really think hard about this question. What do we stand for? And then for whom? Is a museum a tourist attraction? Is, the, a museum, is your museum there just for the community? Is it for both? Is it for something else? For whom? Because there's always this uh, eternal relation, there's always this, this, uh, this uh, very important dialectic between community and museums, between public and museums, that sometimes we tend to put uh, in second place. And this is, this is a very important thing at this point in time. For whom do we are? Once museums understand for whom they stand, then they can actually come up with all the lemonade from the lemons that are being that are available that are unfortunately uh, on our on, on, on our table at this point in time. And then how to engage? How do we engage? There are loads of possibilities. There is no one size fits all. There is a toolbox which we need to understand clearly what that toolbox will include. We need to understand the problem, the challenges, the opportunities, and then choose the right tools for our our toolbox and i think that is that is the 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 i think these are the three essential essential uh, questions that that museums need to 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 ask um i've been getting quite a number of questions uh, i'll try to answer uh, as 
as many as I can. I, I'm, I'm really pleased with all with all your with all your um, um, reactions. Uh, the first one, Sandro, do you think there is a correlation between the pessimism about the income or lack of data for financial vitality of museums and lack of hiring of knowledgeable staff to work on the digital? Should museum professionals gain more long-term vision? I think yes. I think it's a question of handling uh, the situation, but not losing sight uh, of the long term. This is something which also uh, other museum uh, expertise has, has, been, has been highlighting. I mean, it's important that we handle the current situation, but we all know that the situation that we are in will not last forever. We will be out of the woods, hopefully sooner rather than later. So it's very important that we learn from the from, from situation, that we understand what we can do better, where we can improve, what type of approach we can develop for a new norm. It is very important there. The second question, coming from Franco Cavalieri, as income from both public and private actors will probably decrease some way, and so will incomes from shops, cafes, tickets, what other sources of income do you see for your museum? Well, I think there is, a, there is an opportunity there. Um, if we go by, for example, um, non-governmental organizations, who would usually have a membership uh, fee or would usually collect uh, funds and money from local communities to create a project, uh, this sense of ownership can actually create new, uh, new revenue streams, new possibilities. We could also perhaps think of loans, uh, you know, museums getting a loan from the community, however, trying to get funds from, from the community, from the larger public, Rather than from from the one-offs, from the from the from the sponsor, from from the mega sponsor, or a hybrid of both. We don't have a quick fix for this. We still need to learn what the impact is going to be. I believe there is opportunity even in this because going back to your publics and getting asking for funding from from your publics, asking from asking your community to help you out, especially if you were there to help them in times of need, might yield not just the funding and support, especially for, for, for small museums, because the bigger museums are a bit more complex to handle, but even the sense of bonding that is, that is sometimes missing uh, between the museum and its, and its corresponding and its corresponding community. Um, question from Julia. What do you think is necessary in the museum? What kind of staff and resources to engage more digitally, as seen in the example in three museums? Also, what kind of infrastructure, skills, Staff, yes. Um, I think first and foremost, uh, yes, there is there is uh, there is the trend even at the at the at the at the um, Musa conference uh, where Nemo was also uh, active. Um, th there has been discussion of creating new museum profiles, and these four museum profiles, if I'm not mistaken, focus on the digital. Uh, there are other skills. Uh, some of the skills without, we might not even be aware at this point in time that we need them, but there is there is the skill uh, to there is the need of a skill which is about engaging, which is about speaking a language which people understand. More than a skill, it's about a mindset. It's about a culture change. We need to rethink the way our publics uh, understand or perceive museums to be all about. If if I go back to the American Alliance of of museums um, uh, survey, it does uh, say a lot in this respect that people are expecting a certain type of, of approach, a certain type of, of, of product or experience, and museums were thinking that the, the virtual tour is what the publics out there, museum publics or, or the audiences might, might need. So a better understanding, a culture change, new mindsets as to how to really uh, engage with your publics. And I think these three questions are fundamental. What do we stand for, for whom, and how do we engage? These, these questions can create a number of profiles which are more specific to, to the community, to the category, uh, or to, to the context to which that museum, that museum belongs. Another question from Mira. How the museum could see the future for us? young new resources that are entering now in the reality of working in a museum, 
Do you think there is important changes that have to be taken in order to include us in this new scenario? Well, I think, I hopefully, uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that the younger generation will bring the, will usher in the change that museums need. And I think getting a younger uh, staff, uh, staff deployment to work in museums will certainly get museums to think uh, beyond, to be innovative, to sometimes even risk. Uh, there's, at this point, there's, it's difficult to think of anything which is cast in stone. I mean, that is the actual survival of the museum as we have known it. But it might be the case that we, we need to change that, and I strongly believe that we should be changing that, we should, we should be reinventing that into something that is much more human-centered. And I think a younger audience can contribute uh, a, a, a younger um, staff staff uh, staff intake can certainly can certainly can certainly contribute that, and I think it is where museums need to be more agile. Uh, sometimes museums are understood uh, very often they are actually uh, quite quite structured, quite difficult to engage uh, with a situation where change is, is is happening at such a fast rate. I was very surprised, and 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 I was. I was Positively surprised with the way museums have reacted in all this, because in honest, uh, in, in, in all honesty, uh, the reaction was quite fast, and and I've seen some of the best ideas coming from smaller museums, from younger curators, um, from younger museum professionals. Some of them I've met at at, at We Are Museums or Nemo conferences and other platforms. I think the younger generation can really bring bring change. Um, one other question, have you, it's coming from, uh, yes, Mira, one again, yes. Hi Sandro, have you any advice for museums communication managers to engage media in particular? Well, I think as we have seen, um, there is no one quick fix, there is no one size fits all. And I think um, there is a lot of experience out there that we can build on. There are museums that have been doing amazing things. It's a question of not just doing it for the physical visitor at, at this point in time. I think it's a question of rethinking how we look, how we understand who the visitor is, who the public is. There is a situation now, it was there before, but perhaps we are much, we are much more aware of it now, whereby the physical visitor could also, would also be online. It's the same person, or there is a healthy overlap there. So, creating content for just the virtual, for just the for just the social media platform, and not taking into consideration that this person could also be be visiting, or could be the one and the same person who would be visiting, uh, is is an important consideration. And I think we. The more multidisciplinary the thinking is, the more we think of transmedia as a, as a possibility, the more incisive we can be. This is very much like, for example, I don't know, Harry Potter, no? The Harry Potter book, you've got the book, you've got the film, you've got the products. All of them individually provi provide uh, a unique experience. But collectively, they can bring a much better, more articulate, a richer experience if experienced collectively. And this is how I believe uh, social media for museums might need to work. It might need to work much more with exhibition uh, curators to bridge. Uh, it might need also to work with other, other categories, other departments. The more the message guides uh, a, broader very, a broader variety of media, the more incisive that message can, can be. I'll just take one last uh, question. There are so many. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with, with all your, with all your um, and reactions. Uh, yes, and... Um, Yes, one other question coming from, yes, from Marlene, yes. Marlene asks, uh, during the, this pandemic, social inequality became an even more visible and challenging issue. Poor families or elderly 
not had easy access to digital resources when everything went digital. What can museums do to address this? How can they enhance their social role, especially for vulnerable people? I think we've discussed some interesting, some interesting case studies. And uh, the Lab Museum example is a case in point. Um, the, the Poland uh, Museum example, the radio transmission, is also a good, a good example. Um, at, this point, at, at this point in time, what perhaps we need to understand clearly is how to pass on the message. There is a message, there is a vision, there is a narrative, there, is a, there are stories to be told. There is the public on the other side. We have a vague idea at this point in time as to who this public is, what uh, the expectations of that, of that public are. It's a question of finding the right tools to transfer that message to the public out there. In the case of special needs or or um, or, uh, or or circumstances that that I mean that people don't have actually uh, that are not digital natives or they are not that 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 uh, conversant with uh, with um, technology, then it's a question of using traditional media. It could just be a letter sent uh, to uh, to someone who visited the, the museum um, two months ago, three months ago, and just invite him back and just tell him what you're doing. I would be surprised to, re to receive a letter from a museum inviting me to, to visit or telling me what, what, uh, what, uh, what uh, that museum is up to. I'd like to thank everyone uh, for this uh, for this hour. Thank you for finding time to follow to follow me to to uh, to ask the questions that you, that 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 you have sent. I'm I'm available on email. Uh, I'll be following this up on my blog publication with, with other posts. And uh, wishing you good luck. Stay safe, and uh, hope you you get inspired. Be inspired is my message. Thank you.